Tracy Melchior has had one of the most successful soap opera careers with roles on Aaron Spelling's Sunset Beach, One Life to Live, and the global phenomenon, The Bold and the Beautiful. In her feature film, Do You Believe with Mira Savino, which was number one in DVD sales on Amazon and a top 10 in national box office for three weeks. Then several years ago, Tracy was forced to focus solely on her health when she was faced with a debilitating condition with mysterious symptoms. Now she shares her experience to help others avoid what she went through. And in her autobiography, Breaking the Perfect Ten, she opens up about her flawed pursuit of fame and fortune and the redemption she has achieved through Christ. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome actress, director, producer, and author, and again, one of the most successful actresses in television, Tracy Melchior. Welcome to the show. I feel like I should look behind me for who you're talking about. <laughs> she sounds great. <laughs> well, I would say that you are, and I'm really interested because how in the world did you get started in acting? Oh, it's kind of a funny story because I, my family moved a lot. And when I was in seventh grade, we moved to a small town in Colorado, Elizabeth, Colorado. And we met we, that my parents moved me mid semester. So the only elective class that had a vacancy or opening that they could put me in was acting drama. And I was like, Lord, you hate me. I knew it. And so here I am, seventh grade, which is such an awkward age, new to a school, and I'm in a drama class. It was like my own little, you know, things, closet of fears. And, um, and I ended up falling in love with it. And it just kind of has been sort of the theme of my life is like, it looks like a bad thing, but a lot of times it's not, you know? Well, did the acting, you know, by going into drama class in school, was it something that actually helped you build confidence and courage? Yeah. You know, I think I was always curious about like my feelings, like what was going on inside of me and human behavior, why people were doing what they were doing in my life. And um, so studying human nature just became, you know, something that was very interesting to me. And so I ended up um, through that, my stepdad was a newscaster in Colorado for about 20 years on Channel 7 out there, if anybody remembers KMGH7 and John Lindsay. And um, so he got a talk show called AM Colorado, and he would interview, you know, actors out promoting films and stuff like that. And whenever it was somebody really that I was curious about or a film I liked, I remember Lou Diamond Phillips um, had come through and I would get to go in the green room and I'd get to meet these guys and just talk about, you know, the career and, you know, their how they got in and all that stuff. And it just became, um, you know, I knew it's what I wanted to do. So after high school, I went to the Denver Center of Performing Arts and um, did that for the summer. And then I moved to L.A. Um, not long after that. Oh, I went to CSU for a little bit, but I ended up not staying and finishing my degree, which I kind of regret. But and then I moved to L.A. and just, you know, I don't know how far you want to go. But this <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what what type of challenges did you have? I guess, you know, to, you know, to go out to Hollywood, I'm sure it was countless auditions. Um, were there were there experiences that uh, through those auditions that helped you? Or were there some wondering, why am I actually here? Well, you hope you get countless auditions, right? Even getting auditions at first is, you know, the goal. Um, so I just feel like when I look back on my life, it's like I just, God really guided me a lot through it. So I started, I needed a job. So I was working at this um, manufacturing facility and I was not fulfilled. And I ended up going and teaching aerobics. So I was very, you know, I was, I was working out and I was like, you know what, I can do this. They were saying they needed instructors. So I started teaching aerobics at Valley's in um, LA. It was popular at the time, but, um, and a guy came up to me and he's like, are you a model? And I'm like, no, <laughs> never felt like I could model. And he's like, you should model. He goes, a friend of mine just opening, opened up a modeling um, agency. And I think she would really love you. And I was like, okay. Well, her name was Irina Kamal and she had come from the Playboy modeling agency and started her own agency. 
And when I first went in to see her, she's like, well, where, where's your work? And I'm like, well, I've never modeled. I don't have anything. And she's like, well, go get some work and come back and I get some, you know, tear sheets for me. And I go, well, I don't know how to do that. I go, do you like my look? The guy said you would like, and, and she goes, yeah, I think you could do well. And I go, well, then help me get tear sheets. <laughs> and she liked the tenacity. And so she did. She got me in with like some, you know, photographers who were just doing test shoots or stock photos. And it from there, then she got a commercial agent. And then that commercial agent started sending me out. And so it just sort of happened. Yeah, I like the fact that you just basically just told her up front, I don't know how to do this. And if you think I have the look, then you need to help me. And, and I think a lot of people today, especially young people, they don't know how to ask. They don't know how to, you know, I think mo more people today have a lack of confidence and, and let their insecurities rule them. I really had a lack. It, it was this weird dynamic with me. I had a lot of insecurities but you know when you're desperate you have a lot of drive i mean i was literally sleeping on like the floor of a friend from high school's apartment you know and when you, you're you know when you're desperate and you have drive and you're you know focused on your goal one of my favorite quotes from henry ford is goals are just the things you see when you lose focus i'm sorry obstacles are the things you see when you lose sight of the goal and I knew I needed her. She was a good in. And I don't know where it came from in me, but honestly, I've had to fight for a lot of things that I've gotten in my life. And I guess, you know, that just came out. Well, then what type of challenges have you had in your career? Um, numerous. Um, <laughs> so, well, with, um, let's see, what could I say? Well, okay. So after that, I went, I got an acting agent from, cause I started doing commercials. I got into the union, um, kind of interesting how I started and got into screen actors field, by the way, was as a stunt double. Really? Yes. <laughs> so I am an avid horseback rider. I grew up on a horse farm in Colorado and rode horses was like my therapy. Like I just rode all the time. And, um, there was one of uh, that, that agency, the commercial agency, there was an audition for an old spice commercial and it was riding a horse bear back on the beach. And I auditioned for the commercial, but when they had us at the ranch to, you know, see if we could ride, they hired me as the double and hired someone else as the talent. And I don't know how much time you want it. It's kind of a cool story though, but we flew up to Bodega Bay and it was the first time I was working on a union job and, you know, flying and getting put up. It was pretty fun for me. But when I had to meet the van downstairs at the hotel, gathering around was the male lead and this other woman, we were all catching the bus, you know, to set. And, um, you know, it was like, so who are you? What do you do? And I was like, oh, I'm Tracy. I'm the stunt double. I was really proud of it. And she goes, oh, I'm the talent. And I was just like, hmm, okay. <laughs> and, you know, then it just became where um, in this, on the set, Cochise, my makeup guy, started doing my hair and makeup. And I was like, hey, you don't have to do my makeup. I'm the stunt double. They'll never see my face. And he's like, what? Oh. And so he just matched my hair to hers and she went out on set and then the walkie talkie comes in and they're like, Hey, where's the stunt double? And so I go out and they're like, Hey, our, our talent can't get the horse to run. We're just run, wondering if you can help us set up this shot and, you know, get him squared away. So the show off that I am, I can swing up on a horse bareback, you know, myself without a boost or anything. I just grab the mane and jump up and I took off and they were like, wait, whoa, whoa. Oh, they couldn't catch me. And, you know, it's my first set, really. And I didn't know, wait for action camera, whatever. And so they're like, all right, go back to the hair and makeup. Thank you so much. We, you know, see the horse can do that now. Cochise comes in and starts doing my makeup again. And I'm like, Cochise, we talked about this on the stunt double. They'll never see my face. And he goes, mm -mm, see that van? It's taking her back to the airport. You got the spot. <laughs> wow. Yo, that is so cool because you ended up, on a commercial shoot that ended up well being your wheelhouse of knowing how to ride horses and handle horses and 
that's a that's what I what I call one of those God moments. It, it, when I look back, there's so many of them in my career. And so from there, I did a Coca-Cola commercial riding a horse. I did a Budweiser commercial riding bareback, did music videos, um, some foreign, you know, projects too, where I would do rescues where, um, you know, a guy would ride past you on a horse and then he would scoop up the damsel, like as they're running by and you jump on the back of the horse by him. And it was a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you love most about being an actor? You know, the reason I think for me, I really wanted to be an actor. My why was I wanted a platform. I wanted a voice. You know, I grew up not feeling like I was heard or seen. Um, and then somewhere in there, I realized I'm really not being heard and seen. I'm portraying characters, you know, and, you know, it's very sweet, your intro, but I was never, you know, one who had this huge microphone or, you know, ability to, champion causes i you know to an extent but um that was mostly my thing is i wanted i wanted a voice i wanted to be seen and heard and i you know grew up kind of neglected um a lot of issues with that so i think having that like i craved the um you know kind of what i had at that commercial was like i was the chosen one i was the one who they wanted to see now um, you know, when originally it was like, no, we won't see you. You're just the stunt double. So I was just, you know, I grew up feeling like the tasks I could perform was my value. And that was like the first initiation of, you know, we want to see you. And, you know, it was, it was kind of cool. So, um, yeah, I, I think acting was like, um, therapy. For me and i'm sure for a lot of people well, how too. did you how did you end up in soap operas so again like god was just i joke that um i don't joke but i'm not even that funny but i always say that god's my agent right he gets me the jobs and you know he gets 10 percent. so like he's an agent <laughs> people might not know that but god's a talent agent too that's right um, he is so i uh I was with a, um, I left and had a theatrical agent now. And, oh, you talked about challenges. By the way, I had two agents die within a year of each other. One of a heart attack, one committed suicide. And just, you know, I, it, it, I would find someone who really got me and was sending me out. And I was, you know, I heard this one agent pitch me on the phone. I was there seeing him and I heard him pick up the phone and pitch me. And I was like, kind of like with your introduction, I was like, oh, she sounds great. Who is that? Um, but so I, you know, again, out looking for a new agent and I found one, I was doing really well. And they, back, back in the day, they had divisions for everything. This agency was huge. It was called Abrams and they had a soap opera division, just soaps. And the commercial agent happened to have my headshot on the desk when he came to speak to her. And he's like, who's that? And, you know, and he's like, I think she, she should do soaps. And um, at, he called me and pitched soaps to me. And he was just like, it's a really great career. It's the most normal job you can have in this industry. You go to the same place every day. Um, it's consistent, you know, and, and I was like, hmm. At the time I was studying with Larry Moss, who Larry Moss has been thanked from the Academy Award podium several times by Hilary Swank. I think every film she did, she had him coach her. Um, Jim Carrey, when he won for The Majestic, thanked him for Helen Hunt when she won. So he was like incredible. Well, he was not a big fan of soap opera writing because he was like, my technique will crumble that script, you know? And so I was kind of like torn where I'm like, well, I don't know, what do I want to do? You know, you want, you have these certain visions in your mind of what you think. And I think what has helped me a lot in my career and in life is I'm open, you know? I, you know, people talk about how you hear no a lot in the industry. I think the other mistake people make is how much they say no to. You know, trust the process, you know? See where the, you know, the river is flowing you. Um, and so I was just open to it and it ended up, he was right. It was perfect for my personality and my lifestyle to have 
you know, a regular place to go. I know where I park. I know where wardrobe, you know, familiar faces, you get to know people. Um, and so it, it, it worked out. My first one was like you said, the Aaron Spelling um, soap opera. So did you ever meet Aaron Spelling? I did not. And I am a huge Aaron Spelling fan. I have to say, um, before I got Sunset Beach, I had auditioned for one of his nighttime soap operas. And it was one of probably my worst auditions because I didn't end up going all the way to network with it. And um, just being in that room, I, I remember I wanted to him to like me so bad, I forgot about the scene. You know what I mean? And so it just, it, and it was one where I had to be emotional and I was so focused on me personally, what I wanted than what the character wanted in that audition. But, um, I was really excited to then get on one of his his shows after that. Well, you've had a very successful career in soaps, but, um, a few years ago, uh, you had to take off due to health issues. So, um, what were those health issues and how are you doing now? Yeah, you know, I look back and there were signs for a long time that I know did affect my career because, you know, some of my symptoms were like debilitating brain fog and, you know, energy and things like that. So I know it affected my performance, you know, especially towards the end until it really um, went awry. I kind of joke like it's almost like the car that broke down on the freeway. You know, it was I was muscling through a lot of underlying symptoms and feelings um and then finally it just like the car just broke down on the freeway and i was um pretty much almost in bed for an entire year and there were a lot of things like there were some um do you believe stuff that was coming up promotional things we were you know like movie guide award shows i couldn't go to and stuff because i just physically couldn't do it and i missed out um i turned down several films it was awesome that i you know some even horse related that i was really bummed about some friends were like you know direct you know, hey, we're doing this thing. Would you want to be in it? And I'm like, I don't think I can. Um, well, but what was, yeah, the, what was just, the diagnosis? Well, I had parasites in three different spots and I was completely malnourished. I had Hashimoto, underactive thyroid and MTHFR. Really? <laughs> yeah. Because see, a lot of people don't know the last thing you mentioned and I know what that is. And I'm that's nervous. when you really have to really focus upon diet. If there's any type of nutrition, yeah. you, you have to dive in deep to really understand that. And a lot of people deal with it, but a lot of people don't know they actually have it. Right. Unfortunately, they just know they're starting to get all these autoimmunes and they don't realize the, the root cause of why they're, you know, have a predisposition to them. And, um, I was fortunate and I spent $19,000 one year, just functional medicine, doctors, expensive supplements and, you know, chelations and parasites and, you know, everything. And, you know, I, I was blessed that I was able to afford that, but I know not everyone can. And so I, now I love helping people find, you know, I, I cause my motto is healthy. Shouldn't just be for the wealthy. Not that I'm necessarily wealthy, but no, no, I agree. People have no clue that even on the natural health side, it can get real expensive really fast and insurance doesn't cover things like that. Yeah. It's one of my, you know, beefs with, you know, a lot of these natural doctors is it's people go out of desperation, right? And they, I don't know, sometimes I feel a little frustrated, you know, like I would get, Oh, take this supplement, take this, take that. And then you get your blood work back or, you know, you go the next time and they're like, yeah, stop taking that. And I'm like, well, I still have like a ton of that. What should I do? And they're like, ah, oh, just, and I'm like, I paid a ton of money for that. Oh, uh, I mean, I, I know stories one right after the other. I know how that industry works. Um, it can be very, very frustrating. Um, it's kind of the industry in which people are looking at a magic pill in a bottle and yeah. there's more to health than what's in a bottle. There's what we eat, uh, what we do, how we think it is, you know, body, mind, and spirit is how I look at it. And you have to treat all three areas, but how are you doing now? 
I'm doing good because kind of like what you discussed is, you know, originally it was like what you eat was a lot with MTHFR, right? Because you don't absorb nutrients. So it was ironic that I was eating very healthy, but I was malnourished. I was completely malnourished. <laughs> I had pernicious anemia, all these things. But um, yeah, it's it, it, health is an overall concept. You cannot just, it's not just what you eat. It's not just exercise. Our skin's our largest organ. You know, what we put on our bodies, especially women with makeup, but everything from the shampoo we use, the lotion, the cleaners we use in our home, what we breathe. I mean, we eat maybe three, four or five times a day, right? How many times do we breathe every day? And what you inhale affects your health more than I ever realized. But that was like the last little, you know, I, the functional medicine doctors got me to probably 75% of my health. But then when I figured out this other part, you know, about our skin and, you know, change to all non-toxic products and, and, you know, there's a lot of companies that you think are non-toxic, but you can Google their name and then lawsuit and you'll see they were sued for having <laughs> things in there that they didn't claim to have or what have you. Well, so it's yeah, I, I had the opportunity to do an interview with Campbell Ritchie, which is one of the top makeup artists in the world. Mm. And she is literally uh, anti-chemical. And, oh. and she focuses on the skincare, everything. And she's the most delightful person to talk to. And, she, and um, but anyway, yeah, it's every, you know, our skin is responsible for a lot of things that can ail us. But when you mentioned the uh, MFT uh, THR, did you have to focus on those the methyl related type nutrients? Yeah, exactly. So I had to, you know, you have to go gluten free because most, and it's not so much that you have like people. I, when I tell them that, they're like, "Oh no, I had a gluten test. I'm I'm not intolerant to it, or I don't have celiac." But it's not just that. What happens with the MTHFR? is most gluten foods are fortified with vitamins and minerals. Well, the vitamins and minerals that the government's putting in those fortified foods are pretty synthetic and they're the folic acid, not the natural folate or the methylated um, B9. So for me, I had to get rid of all of that and then get on good methylated supplements um, and just finding a balance. You know, one of the things that happened with me with these naturopaths is they're pumping you with stuff because it doesn't absorb well even that methylated some of them don't absorb well and so they're putting like thirty thousand the daily allowance in you and depending on your body your gut what you've eaten regular you know most recently or what have you it things are going to absorb differently so i ended up toxic in some supplements at times i I literally used to feel like it was my health was balancing on the pin of a needle. Oh, too much of that, too much, of, you know, because there's cofactors in everything, right? You need this for that to absorb and zinc affects copper. And so it's been quite a balancing act. But to answer your question now, I have found everything that works for me. And I do love to share it with people when they um, are looking for another resource because it just needs to be simplified. And I think, you know, it's sad. I watch people, I'll walk into Sprouts or something and I'll just see people like this in the vitamin aisle. And yeah. it's overwhelming and they're trying to be healthy and then they're buying these supplements and they don't feel any different. Because like you said, one thing isn't gonna help. One, yeah. you, know, oh, I you know, I've been in the natural health industry for over 30 years and my biggest argument is marketing is not research uh -huh. and you and it's hard for me sometimes to explain to people what happens behind the scenes in the industry because it it's there's a lot of bad things going on and it's very yeah. hard to lead people in the right direction there's only a few people that i know and trust in the industry who have companies and i only use them yeah. and because they're so they're they're strict to the point of no junk allowed in, in a product, but it, it can be very overwhelming for people. And uh, yeah. I'm just glad that you were able to find a good road to health because that is a, that is a situation. It's even an ailment 
that is extremely, in my book, kind of hard to treat because you could have two people diagnosed with it, but they can't be treated the same. Oh yeah, because it's a gene mutation. Well, your gene has ALs, it has SNPs, you know, it's like there's so many variations to a gene. So it's just the beginning. And then to your other point too, it's like, I love what you said about marketing because a lot of terms are just marketing and even ingredient labels are the headline. They're not the whole article because where something is sourced, where, you know, the, the derivative, the molecule size, how it was refined, you know, it's like, there's more to it. And, you know, I laugh at people who are like, no, I won't, um, I'll only do things that are natural. And I'm like, well, there's, you got to remember, there's a perfect blend of things. Like there's a lot of things in nature that can kill us too, you know? So we just, it's finding this um, balance without consuming all your bandwidth with it. But I, I feel better now in my fifties, 52. And I feel better than I did in my thirties now. So it was, um, you know, a, a, an effort to get here, but and that's why I'm, you know, kind of, I, I joke, I'm coming out of pasture, so to speak, <laughs> and I'm getting back and I, you know, got a new manager and um, we're working on some projects I've been doing, even when I've been going through these health issues, I've been working on producing a few projects I have going um, that I'm really excited about. Um, I don't know if you want to hear about some of well, those. Well, yeah, or... I know that you are working on a project called Monochrome. What is that about? Mm -hmm. So my husband's a police officer. My dad, my I talked about my stepdad being a newscaster. Uh, my biological father is was a police officer, and um, you know, so I, you know, I have a lot of experience there with law enforcement. And I just think it's really sad how um, they're being portrayed. And kind of like you said, it's sort of like marketing almost about them. And I just kind of felt really led in the last several years to do something with my career in pursuit of helping their career. So I'm producing a documentary. It's very different than most documentaries on law enforcement. I'm not just interviewing a bunch of cops in uniform about how hard the job is or how sad it is when one of them dies and all. not to diss those types of projects, but when you have people who actually think you are evil, police are evil. They don't care how hard their job is. They don't care when one of them dies. So we're not going to pull on the heartstrings of people and have them change. All right. You bring up a very vital point. And ladies and gentlemen, you better hear the words coming out of my mouth because I want to tell you like mm -hmm. it is. What Tracy just said is true, but you got to realize where it's coming from. We live in a world where the media narrative is nothing but a lie. If you believe what's coming out of the media's mouth about police officers, you're an idiot. Plain and simple. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. We have police officers, and the majority of the officers are good. Yeah, everyone, every department may have a an arrogant bad apple here and there, but they're here to serve and protect. And whatever you believe from the media about defund the police and these guys are bad, that is a narrative that they've created to manipulate your view. And Tracy, I, I applaud you for doing a project like that. Thank you. And that's one of the points I'm making in there is, you know, the, you hear that a lot to serve and protect. Right. And when some, uh, uh, someone is killed by police and they're like, their job was to serve and protect, but serve and protect is not an individual service that they provide. Serve and protect is the community. See the difference in serving and protecting the community and an individual is when an individual becomes a threat to the community, their, their job isn't now to serve and protect that individual. It's their job is to serve the community as a whole. So when you break free of the community and become a threat to the community, their service to you is quite different. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, yeah, because, you know, I hear, you know, I've, we have all seen the, the, the variety of news stories that have been completely overblown. Um, yeah. Information brought to the public that was incorrect on purpose. And, and for a lot of us, we're kind of like, well, if you would have just 
obeyed the officer, nobody would have got hurt. It's that simple. But exactly. everybody wants to create a narrative today that shines a negative light on police departments across the country. I mean, one of my friends was a chief of police right outside of New Orleans, worked for SWAT, and he has stories that he will never even tell me because <laughs> there's just some things that you don't want to remember or even tell people because that job is extremely difficult. I mean, my gosh, the divorce rate among police officers is extremely high. Yeah, between oh, it's funny because between police and uh, acting, it's amaz amazing we've been married 23 years. Um, but yeah, my husband did 16 years LAPD SWAT. Um, and, you know, there's several times we'd be watching the news and he'd be like, what? <laughs> that is, you know, and he'd be like, oh, man, that's not at all. But, um, you know, it's it's good to get this out. My idea with it is just to start conversation. And the film is to serve kind of as I, I like to say it like the worship music before the pastor speaks, where it just kind of softens people's um you know softens their hearts opens their minds a little bit that there might be another way to look at this i'm not telling people how to think but i'm just saying oh you know maybe i'm not i don't know everything so let me just kind of see both sides and it's just about bringing mutual respect mutual understanding i think it's very dangerous um when for both sides to um what we've done is raised the fear level on both sides and fear is a dangerous emotion. And so now you've got a cop walking up to a, a car. He's more fearful because they're being ambushed more. You're having a suspect who's being told, oh my gosh, he's going to kill me. All he wants to do is kill me. I'm being hunted. Now his fear level is high. Now we've made an ordinary traffic stop more dangerous. Um, so we just, it's just about, you know, how do we, engage with each other so that both sides go home. That's my goal. Exactly. I want to, and it, well, yeah. I know this, when you, when you finish that project and release it, you've got to come back here so we can talk about it because I want to see it. Okay. That's a deal. I you want to see word. it, but I also understand too, because you wrote a book called breaking the perfect 10, um, mm -hmm. which is technically your autobiography. Any plans to make that into a movie? Yeah, I've um, been working with a screenwriter on that. To, um, what I want to do with it as a film is not make it my autobiography. I want to take Tracy out of it. Um, so I've actually kind of, kind of, kind of renamed it. I renamed it. Um, but it's going to base, be based on my testimony. But I want it, I, I, don't, I don't ever want it to seem like I'm drawing attention to myself. But when I look back at the curriculum that God put me through and how, when you look back, you're like, oh my gosh, I see what he was doing all along now. Um, it is a beautiful story and it's more his story, um, but it's what he did in my life as an example of what he can do in yours. And, <clears throat> you know, I think a lot of people can relate to, you know, for me going into acting was just that, you know, God shaped hole in my heart, right? Where I wanted to feel, you know, validated, loved, accepted, and all of those things. And I was looking in all the wrong places, um, which caused me to break all of God's commandments, trying to be Hollywood's perfect 10. So, you know, it's just, um, you know, if you can find God in prison, you can find him in Hollywood too. <laughs> well, since you are a woman of faith working in the industry, when did you actually come to the faith or come to Christ? And what was that like for you working in this industry? Yeah, it was, I was in the industry for, I think about five years before I became a believer. And, um, yeah, there was, there were times I remember, um, and I won't name the soap, but a producer came up to me and she's like, Hey, um, so we're kind of wondering if like, you're going to be able to handle this role because, you know, we need a lot of passion in this love interest. And, um, you know, we know you're a believer. And, you know, at the time, my infant son was coming to work with me and my mom is my nanny. And then, you know, here I'm doing these scenes or what have you. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I go, you know what? I have reconciled this with my faith and with my husband. I appreciate your concern. Um, and 
again, God protected me, even though I was in three different soap operas, the, my love interest on that show, they ended up diagnosing him with AIDS. And back then it was highly contagious still. Like now they've got a lot of, you know, it was very fatal and everything. Um, but back then, you know, we couldn't swap saliva. We had, you know, we had, so it was for as far as like love scenes and stuff, it became very um, protected for me. <laughs> Wow. I would have never even thought that that would actually happen, you know, because even during that time, I, you know, and I've seen the bold and the beautiful and guiding light and one life to live. Never once did I even think about that. And, you know, the AIDS epidemic was brought to light, I, th I believe, in 1981 or up to eight, eight, 1984 when it hit Rolling Stone magazine. From then on, it was, well, yeah, I think it was more of a shock than the, than the pandemic we had. Yeah, I remember like it was Rock Hudson, right? Who they ended up. Oh having. yeah, but, but I would have never even thought about that, that being on a soap opera, that there would be uh, protective measures. But I know you I, think about COVID now, and back then you would have thought we'd all have to get tested or something before kissing scenes or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, for you, um, is there anything that you would like to, uh, to happen in the film industry through all that is taking place right now? Um, well, I'm really excited about going full circle with my career. So I'm working on um, a modern day Western, which I'm very excited about. I'm, it's with a great production company right now. They're, they haven't accepted it, but it's on their desk. <laughs> so getting it on the desk, you know, is a good thing. Um, but it's basically a LAPD mounted unit story, which hasn't been done, which I think is, you know, crazy, but it's written by a former LAPD uh, mounted officer who was a tech supervisor on like every huge film as um, like, for decades. So it's kind of cool. He has both that experience and that. But I'm also, um, you know, I love how the Westerns are coming back. I love the, you know, how that's happening. And I really want to be a part of that. So. Yeah, because there's what? Yellowstone. And then there's the, the pre Yellowstone that was yeah. in 1832 or whatever it's called. So <laughs> what, what now? Huh? What, what did you just say? I've auditioned for those different parts. So hopefully we eventually find a part in there for me because oh. it's nice bringing me back for different things. So, well, I'm like you, I'm glad Westerns are coming back because you know, you, they're just great movies and this, you can create any storyline that you want. So to answer your question more um, specifically, when you say what I would like in the industry, the thing that bums me out a little bit is now with all the streaming stuff, you know, we used to, there was, used to be only certain things you could show on TV and there's so much good stuff out there. And I, I'm like, do I need to see that? Do I, you know, between the love scenes, the violence, the, and I don't know that it was needed for how good the writing is. You know, the writing was good. It's a good story. I don't need to see such gratuitous sex scenes. I don't need to see so much violence. I don't, you know, I, I feel like, unfortunately, that is what seems to be selling. I don't it's, know if it- I call it lazy, on. I call it lazy filmmaking. If you go back into the days where we had, um, let's say, Cary Grant, and let's say that he had a love interest and the love interest walks into his apartment or walked into the bedroom and the door would close. We all knew you didn't have to show it. It's just part of the story. Mm -hmm. But let the viewer have their own imagination. Let, let the filmmaker create the imagination in the viewer without having to show them everything. I think one of the, the worst movie series ever created was Saul. I don't get <laughs> it. I mean, one of my dearest friends created the, the gore genre in film. And, but it's, it's been taken way, way too far. 
and, yeah, uh, it, and they've normalized that emotion. They've normalized the idea and they wonder why our society is the way it is. Yeah, I mean, when I started my acting career, there was this, well, you might have to do some nudity just to get, you know, get your foot in the door. You might have to do some sex scenes to get your foot in the door. It was something, it was almost like something you felt like you might have to do, but at the beginning of your career. Now I'm seeing like huge name actors basically doing soft porn, where I'm like, that used to be like a price you had to pay to get where they're at, and now they're just doing it. Yeah, well, to me, Tracy, Netflix is like signing a deal with Satan. You don't mm -hmm. know what's down the road. It's kind of like Harry and Meghan signing their deal, and now they're wanting to get out of it because True. they're being told to do things they didn't see coming. Yeah, and it's it's um, it's scary because as an actor, you sign a series regular contract or what have you. When you do sign on for a film, you read the script. You know the entire script. You know pretty much where we're going. Of course, things can be added, but for the most part, you know what you're signing on for. But when you sign on for a series, you're you have no idea where it's going. And same with soap operas. You know we don't know where our characters going or what they're going to have us doing. And I think that. Um, kind of like what you said, that's been where these actors maybe have felt like, oh my gosh, now I'm into it. And now they're, you know, you open up your script for next week and they've got you doing a salacious love scene or what have you, you know? And so I don't know how it got here, but, um, you know, I, I would hope that, you know, you would get to that point in your career where you don't have to do those things, you know? Yeah, and I, and I see that social media has made things even worse for actors and actresses. Um, some of them jumping ship, going to only, fan, only fans, which I think is what is wrong with you. But there's a fine line between, when it comes to social media, between narcissism and insecurity. And I think yeah. the lines are starting to be blurred. Yep, we gotta remember Jesus didn't have that many followers, but he was pretty famous. <laughs> I've got to remember that one. That that is absolutely true. And uh, so 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 with all of the projects that you're working on, so you're just full steam ahead in the next chapter of your film career. Yeah, you know, I I again, it just seems like I get pulled back in. I love acting. I and there is nothing like being on a set. And whether I'm acting or even doing some of the producing stuff I've been doing, I, I even enjoy that. I just love being on a film set. There is just something about this collaboration of people who it's like, okay, we need to do this, whatever it is like, and everybody all hands on deck will be like, okay, we can do this and we can do that. I love that. I love the team of it. Um, so I, I just feel like, you know, my, I have two children, by the way. I have a very big age gap. That was another thing that, you know, I'm just one of those mothers who just obsesses over their children and I'm a little bit neurotic. So, you know, I had another um, son later in life at 39 and I just was all about him. Well, now he's 13, he's playing sports, he's at school, he's got friends, you know, so I just have my health back. My kids are older, they're not as reliant on me um for the day to day and i'm like you know what my husband's also going to be retiring soon so i'm like can you be my house husband and i'm going to go back to work it's my turn i love that now where can all of my viewers and listeners find out more about tracy melchior um well i am on social media speaking of the socials um my name is spelled m-e-l-c-h-i-o-r it's kind of like choir but spelled wrong um and I am on Instagram that. I also have a website, tracymelchior.com. And um, yeah, all of those. I, I'm not a big poster. I don't post a lot, but I do engage and I do return messages. Um, I get a lot of people who are like, I can't believe you responded. Um, so I do try and you know respond if people message me and, and if you ever have any questions. All right, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Tracy Milker, like I said, one of the most successful actresses on television and definitely in soap opera history. And Tracy, again, uh, open invitation. When Monochrome comes out, 
please get back with me and we can have an absolute discussion on that incredible subject matter in bridging the gap between the police and our communities. And I can't wait to see what other projects and also what other uh, films or series that you may appear in. And uh, much, uh, many blessings to you. I appreciate that. It was lovely to meet you and um, get to get to know you a little bit as well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Tracy Melchior, go to tracymelchior.com. Again, just like she said, it's spelled M-E-L-C-H-I-O-R.com. And of course, connect with her through social media. And uh, again, check out all of her work. And, uh, and I can tell you this, there is more coming our way. And again, thank you so much, Tracy, for being on the program. And for all of you, I will be right back with more.